What if you could decide today to become an automatic millionaire simply by changing just a few daily habits? And the good news is you only have to make the decision one time. And then you could be 100% certain for sure that you would, in fact, retire as an automatic millionaire. Well, on today's show, the nine-time New York Times bestselling author, Mr. David Bach, joins us to teach you his secrets for becoming an automatic millionaire. Some shows don't need a celebrity narrator to introduce the show. But this show does. Two men. Eight kids, co-created by two different women. Thirteen multi-million dollar businesses. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Thrive Time Show. Yes, yes, and yes. Thrive Nation, ladies and gentlemen, on today's show, we are interviewing a nine-time New York Times best-selling author who is best known for his Finish Rich book and the Automatic Millionaire series of financial books. He's just recently released his 20th anniversary edition of his mega-seller, Smart Women Finish Rich. David holds an undergraduate degree from the University of Southern California, and throughout his career, he has appeared on the Today Show. CNBC, Fox Business, Live with Regis and Kelly, The View, Larry King, The Oprah Winfrey Show, and anywhere on the planet that TVs are sold. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, David has impacted my life in a profound way with this thing he calls the latte effect. Let's welcome on, without any further ado, Mr. David Bach. Welcome on, sir. Wow, I love it. Well, it's great to be on the show with you. Thank you for, I don't know, just a totally awesome introduction. <laughs> I love your energy. David, uh, years ago, my wife and I, we were getting this book called The Automatic Millionaire because I don't do road trips unless I have an audio book. And then after, if I listen to the audio book and I like it, I buy the physical book. So I picked up the book called The Automatic Millionaire. And at the time, I had a company called DJ Connection, which I later sold. But before I sold it, we were doing 4,000 weddings or corporate events uh, a year. And it still exists wow. today. DJConnection.com. And you said, you challenged me. You said, you, Mr. Clay Clark, you, Mr. Listener, you, Mr. Whoever you are, you have to save at least one hour per day of income, regardless of how much money you're making. And at the time, I was making a copious amount of money. Can you talk to us about the importance of beginning to save one hour per day of income, regardless of how much money we're making? Yeah, I mean, I would love to because honestly, this is what should be taught to you before you get out of like the eighth grade. So let me start by saying this. The average person in America is going to work 90,000 hours. That's a lot of hours, right? So, right. And then, you know, if you're, and if you're both working, which today many families, you know, both work, right? You could have a family that the two of you combined will work over 200,000 hours during your lifetime. So if you just take that math and you go, well, geez, well, so I guess if people are working so hard, then they must all end up with a lot of money, right? Cause they're, you trade your time for money when you go to work. So are they? And, and that's, that's really the core issue. They're not right. So one out of two Americans right now, according to the federal reserve, can't get their hands on $400 in case of emergency purposes. True. $400, $400 right? 400, yeah. So like, so the follow-up book to The Automatic Millionaire was actually a book called Start Late, Finish Rich. And when I wrote Start Late, Finish Rich, the thing that blew my mind away was that the statistics said that 60% to 70% of Americans live paycheck to paycheck. So what I started saying to people was, look, here's the deal. The, the entire secret to building wealth is that you have to fight for your paycheck and you have to keep the first hour day of your income. And what that means, super simple, is you go to work at 9 o'clock and you work until five on a typical day, you need to keep whatever you earn the first hour. So from nine to 10, let's say you make $20 an hour or $50 an hour or $100 an hour. Whatever that first hour of income is, it's gotta go straight to you. And the only legal way to have it go straight to you where it doesn't go to taxes or social security or state tax. Like I live in New York City, right? I've got federal tax, I've got state tax, Oof. I've got city tax. I've got social security tax. 
When I earn a dollar, all over 40 cents on the dollar is gone before I can ever see it, right? Right. The only way I cannot pay those taxes, and the keyword here is legally, is if I take money that first hour day of my income and I put it in a deductible retirement account. So for someone who's listening that's got a job, it's going to be like a 401k plan. Or if you're a teacher, it's going to be a 403b plan. Or if you're a government worker, it might be a TSA plan. Um, or if you're self-employed, like you probably, you know, you were self-employed, yep. right? When you had this DJ connections, yep. Yep. it's a self-employed retirement account. It's like a SEP IRA account. And, you know, many entrepreneurs don't even fund these accounts because they don't even know about them. So the whole concept of, of pay yourself first one hour day of your income is that if you do that, you're saving 12 and a half percent of your gross income. And that's a really good starting number. Now, I got to be honest, I'm starting to try to get Americans to save more than that. You know, 15 to 20 percent of your gross income is even better. And I taught that in the automatic millionaire. Like if you want to get right. rich faster, it's it's 15 to 20 percent. But getting people to focus on one hour a day of your income, I really do think it's been a game changer. Like when I wrote when I put out the automatic millionaire, we launched the book on the Oprah Winfrey show. And this is back in 2004. And this idea of getting people to think about it in terms of why would you go to work and not keep the first hour day of your income, I think it was like a light bulb moment for people. Like obviously it reached you, right? Like it, you remembered it and it got other people to kind of go home and think about that and talk about it with their wife and talk about it with their family and make that a goal. You know, and one, it's a it's a great goal. One thing that, uh, uh, and I, I mean this in a positive way. So if you if you if, if you don't like this compliment, if you feel like this is a backhanded compliment, you can feel free to hang up, and I'll know. Click. I'll pick up on that subtle <laughs> cue. But um, you are not um, Yoda. You know, you're more of a Broda. I mean, you are like the way you write. The way you write is like I feel like it's my brother from another mother writing on a third grade grade level that I can understand. You don't talk in financial jargon. Your books are very. Uh, easy to read, easy to understand. They're real page turners. I mean, they're very easy to read. And I, in one of your books you wrote, you said, the number one financial mistake is not to have your finances on automatic. And I wrote that down in my man journal. Man journal. I wrote it down. And I wrote down, I go, automatic. I mean, everything about my company, DJ Connection, was automatic. Every DJ had a checklist for their shows. After the wedding, we sent the bride a survey. Based on their survey, we determined how much the DJ got paid. And so if a DJ got a bad review, he made very little money. If he got a great review, he made a lot of money. And everything in my life's automatic. Checklist, systems, processes. Why aren't my finances automatic? Can you explain to our listeners what it means to have? Help us. Help us get our finances on automatic. Yeah, well, I mean, here's why it needs to be automatic. I mean, I, I learned this by being a financial advisor, working with people in the real world. What I saw is that when someone says, you know, I'm disciplined, David, I'm going to write a check, I'll bring you the money every month to save, nobody did it, right? right? Like, no. they might they might do it for two months. The record was six. So what I, what I saw firsthand was the only way people will, will really save money for whatever it is, retirement, buying a home, college savings, wanting to start a new business. The only way people are successful at investing and saving is when they save automatically and, and when they have the money moved automatically. So the automatic millionaire was really about simple idea and nothing's changed because it's timeless principles. First of all, don't try to have a budget because budgets suck. Like, you know, people have been told for decades and generations, you need a budget. No, if, if budgets worked, then everybody would be wealthy. <laughs> I mean, they, they don't, you know, they're, but you go on a budget, you, they're totally frustrating to set up. Couples fight over their budgets all the time. What works is saving money automatically. So I taught in the automatic millionaire, throw the budget out. I, I learned with my clients, forget the budget. Let's just make sure you're taking 10% off the top or 20% off the top. Let's move this money automatically. Every time money comes in, let's move it automatically into the places it needs to go. And that's kind of the, the next part of automation is where does the money need to go? And when you get into real financial planning, if you were to simplify it, which is what I, I live to do is to make it simple because the problem with money is people make it too complicated. True. If, if you were to simplify money, there's like a handful of things that you need to make automatic. You need your bills made automatic. You need your emergency account made automatic. Oh. You, you need your retirement account made automatic. And then yes. you need a dream account made automatic. Oh, yes. 
David, and, and, I, I want to put this all in the show notes. Well, you just, I'm, I'm, I want to, in my passive aggressive attempt to book you on the show again. I mean, you are <laughs> so good. You're, you're preaching this automatic, automatic, automatic. Somebody out there is going, I want to make it automatic. What do I do? What do I do, David? And here's the thing that's incredible is like, this used to be so hard. This didn't used to be easy to do, right? Like 20 years ago, I got in this business in 1993. I had to think about this for a second. So, yeah. you know, back in the day, if you had come into my office and I was at Morgan Stanley and, and I wanted to just automate a savings account for you, I'd have to have you fill out like six pieces of paperwork. It, it was a huge process, right? Today, when somebody wants to do anything automated, now with technology, you can literally open up your iPhone, go click, click, click. And most financial service companies today are at a point where you can have finan your financial life, in some cases, automated in less than 10 minutes. You can open up a savings account in less than 10 minutes online. You can, uh, you can have an automated re retirement account with a diversified portfolio in less than 10 minutes. Like it's Things have been made really simple. And by the way, that simplicity is also making it so that now more and more people are, are saving money automatically. There are now a lot of people who are building real wealth because of automated savings. And by the way, back in 1993, a lot of our listeners probably couldn't focus on their finances because they were listening to Whoop, There It Is. Oh, oh and yeah. Now, and now people have the ability to focus. That song was hot back in 1993. Just a little DJ fun factoid for you. Now, I want, I want to ask you this because I know there's somebody out there who's a big fan of Marie... Forleo. And I saw you on an interview with her where you were uh, you were quoted as, as, as having written in the past, you wrote, we need to start with our values because your values can determine how hard you're willing to work to achieve your financial goals. How much money you currently spend and how much money you will actually need for retirement. Could you talk to us about the importance of knowing our financial values? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, first of all, I love Marie Forleo, and I love that you watched that video. It's a yeah. great video, and they can people can go and find that David Bach, Marie Forleo. I'll put a link put to a, it on the show notes. Yeah, because that was a great interview, and I love her, and she's here in New York City also, and we've become good friends. And you know what I what I what I've and I've known Marie for over ten years, and I think you know what I what I've always talked about since the beginning of my career is that all financial planning is personal, but it should be based off your values. If you can look at what's really most important to you, why do you want money? Instead of just saying like, oh, I want a million dollars. Like, why, why do you, what, what, what is it that you want? Why do you want money? Well, geez, I want to be financially free. Well, what does that mean to you? You know, I'd like to go start a new business or I'd like to take my family to Hawaii or I, you know, I want to make sure that my, I have security. Um, I want to be able to give back to my community. If you can drill down deeper into what your values are, and I teach in, in some of my first books, like Smart Women Finish Rich, yep. uh, which we just put out as a 20-year anniversary edition. That was my first book. Smart Women Finish Rich starts by having you look at what your values are. And once you're clear on your values, you make your financial goals based off of those. And then you do all a, your financial planning I around. I have a quick confession real quick because this is this might get weird. Chuck, this might get weird for the listeners out there. This Sometimes it does. I mean, that's I'm sorry, Dave. I know we're just meeting each other. I feel like I've known you forever because I've listened to every interview you've ever done. We go but way back. Here's the deal. I actually read Smart Women Finish Rich in preparation for today's show. And you did. Yeah, wow. we, we had the 20th anniversary, and it was like it was, it was it was it was you know it wasn't super woo woo. I mean, you didn't tell me. Clay, make sure you get estrogen injections. I mean, it wasn't super weird. I mean, but the thing is, there's so many women in my in, in my case, in my, my family, my wife and I, we work, we have five kids and we work together on everything. We work together in every business. And I'm offense, my wife's defense, and the service we offer or the or the product we offer for any company is uh, the, the the special teams. I'm the offense, I do the marketing, the advertising, that kind of the sales. And my wife does the accounting, the financial planning. And when I picked up the book, that's what my wife does. Vanessa does the financial planning for our family. And I think there's a lot of women out there who have their head down and they assume that their husband is doing the financial planning. They assume that they're doing something. They go through a divorce. They go through a medical issue. Their husband passes away. Something terrible happens. And then they, and they, and they discover that their husband has not been actually saving money. Can you talk to the ladies out there, all the single ladies, all the married ladies, all the sophisticated mamas out there who are finding themselves totally unaware of what's going on financially and why they should pick up Smart Women Finish Rich? 
Yeah, well, I mean, absolutely. So Smart Women Finish Rich was the first book that I wrote. And I'm glad that you read it because, you know, I, I give that book to a lot of my guy friends back when I wrote it. And it's very helpful. I think the thing for women to know is this. If, if you're in a marriage right now and you have a good marriage, that's great. But what you need to know is you're going to outlive your husband. Oh, come right? on. So, so, so negative. So, so, but no, I mean, I, I'm going to, I'm going to like cut to the chase here. Cause there's really three core issues that women face. Mm. In most cases, women outlive their husbands. 80% of, of women die widowed and 80% of men die married. Boo. So <laughs> the average age of widowhood, when I wrote the book originally was 56. Ooh. Today it's it's fifty it's gone up it's fifty nine that's yes. still that's still really young <laughs> oh, and and for you know the family and, and that and people go how is that possible well, because women tend to marry men that are older men pass away first so the first thing you need to know is I always tell ladies I don't care if you're married to the local bank president at some at some point there's a very good chance you, you'll be the one in charge of the money the time to be in charge of not just paying the bills but knowing where all the money is is today so knowing. Where's the will? Where's the life insurance? Do we have life insurance? Where are the retirement accounts? Are we putting enough away in our retirement accounts? Are the beneficiaries up to date? Um, you know, where's the college savings plan? All these things. There's like 17 things that I list in in the book. That there's like a little uh, what I call the finish rich quiz, and it, it, you go through all these questions to, to take a look at like what do you know or what don't you know, so that you can get on track with it. But the thing women need to know is you're going to be in charge of the money at some point. So the best time to be in charge of the money is now. The second thing to know is you're going to live longer in retirement than most men do. Women are often retired 5, 10, 15, 20, some cases 30 years longer than their husbands. So you need more money set aside for retirement. And the third thing you need to know is that a lot of women – are earning less than men, which women know this, but the reasons why are, are, are haven't changed a lot over 20 years. One is, first of all, they, they're not paid equally in many cases, but then they're also taking, they take time off from work to be full, to be full-time moms, which is a full-time job. And on average, women take somewhere between seven to 11 years off from work at prime earning years. So when they have children and then, you know, I don't know, it doesn't sound like your wife did this, but when a lot of women have children, that becomes their full-time job. And therefore, they're walking away from work or they're having to leave work because of their situation in their prime earning years, which impacts their income and impacts how much money they have in savings. And it's not just in savings. It's in Social Security and it's in pension plans. And women have less money in Social Security and pension plans. So what Smart Women Finish Rich was all about was empowering women to wake up to what it is you specifically need to do to fix this what's called a retirement gap. How do you protect yourself as a woman? And my my mission, my mantra for 20 some years has been I don't care if you're a woman, I don't care if you're married, single, widowed, divorced, you have to be the one in charge of your financial life. And you know, I learned about money from my grandmother, Rose Bach. She was a woman who started with nothing, without a college education. She became a self-made millionaire. She was broke at 30. She learned how to do this, and she passed the lessons forward. She taught my father how to do it, myself, my sister. And really, when I started teaching seminars for women and money back in 1994, it was in an effort to basically pass along these lessons from my grandmother because I had seen so many women hurt through widowhood and divorce financially. And I just wanted to do something about it. And, you know, the crazy thing is here, I'm here 24 years later. I Smart Women Finish Rich has sold a million copies. It's one of the most popular books for women and money that's ever been out. And when I'm psyched that you just read it, because when I went to go update it, you know, the, the message was timeless. I just had to update things like the tax rules and the, the different retirement accounts that are available and the different financial service companies. But the message is timely. It's timeless and it's timely. Um, so I think more women today are waking up to, you know, the new two world, we're waking up to the fact that, like, you want to be in charge of your life, be in charge of your money. David, uh, you know, and just for the listeners out there who, who, who uh, listen to our show regularly, I want to I want to show this with you. Um, when I was building DJ Connection, my wife and I, we got married when we were 20 years old. You know, we're 20 years old. Wow. We started our company. We didn't, everyone kept saying, when's the baby due? We, did, we weren't pregnant. We just got married early. We went to Oral Roberts University in Tulsa, Oklahoma. We started DJ Connection. We decided, you know, we want to have five kids. We want to be married for a few years. 
And so we ended up having, we were married about four years, and then we had five kids under the age of seven. Boom, oh. boom, boom, and then uh, twins at one time. Boom, boom. And so my wife did peace out. She did leave. She did exit the daily operations of the company. But every week, she would look at our finances, and she would say, baby, are you saving some money? And I would say, because I'm, I'm, I'm the spender in the family, David. You know, I go, baby, baby, I just want to buy a little bit of pinion wood, just a little bit of uh, nice limestone rocks for my backyard. I just want, and I'm the guy who always wants to buy one more accoutrement, one more piece of decor. You know what I mean? I'm the guy who likes to buy speakers, new microphones. I'm kind of an audiophile. But my wife would always rein it in and say, this is how much you can spend this week. And, the, and when, when she first started presenting this to me about year two of our marriage, I thought, she hates me. She hates me. She, she hates me. I thought that because my wife would tell me, you have definitely exceeded your $1,000 per week discretionary spending you know, budget or whatever. And so next week you can spend $200. And I'm like, oh, you're unbelievable. Why, why do you hate my dreams? But I think there's somebody out there in the family. Talk to the couples out there. Maybe the husband's the one who's locking down the, you know, locking down the automatic savings. Maybe it's the wife who's doing it. Can you talk about why the person who's being financially prudent and who sets up the, the automatic millionaire process is not actually the enemy? But they're actually the hero. Well, okay, so let me ask you, because this happened to you. Are yeah. you glad that she did this to you? <laughs> yes, yes. But I was so pissed consistently. <laughs> so, so I thought this, she hated me every week, but then I was happy the next week. So let's talk about you, because you're living, a living, breathing example of this. When did you turn the corner and realize, you know what, actually, this was a pretty good idea. I'm glad we did this. <laughs> a little confession. I know you're not a priest, but you could be the, the financial coaching priest for people out there. I've been married 17 years. I'm 37. And I think when I turned 27, I finally said thank you because I'm a horrible person. <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting, right? Because you, it's, it's seven years. So I, I don't, right. I, I think what it is is that here's the truth about saving and investing and doing these things really right. You don't notice the impact, the, the positive impact always right away. You might notice the pain at first, right? Like, oh, I don't have the oh. money. I'm not being allowed to go out. Yeah. Like, my gra I'll lose my grandmother box. She realized at 30 she was broke, living paycheck to paycheck, and was never going to be able to get ahead unless she changed things in her life. And so she started saving 50 cents a week, 50 cents out of her paycheck, 50 cents out of my grandfather's paycheck. In order to do that, she had to go. She worked at Gimbel's department store in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and she had to brown bag her lunch. Mm. And when she went to Gimbel's with her brown bag of lunch and her girlfriends would go out to lunch, they would tease her and be like, oh, Rose, you're so cheap. And she'd say, you know what? I've made a decision. I'm going to start saving money because I want to have I want to retire down to the beach at some point. And they Good. laughed at her. Right. Well, you know, later on in life, she wasn't spending the winters in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where it's freezing. She was at the beach in Laguna Beach, California. And, you know, but that took four that took like four decades. Right. right so right, right. Where, where I go back to for you is like seven years, right? Like it makes sense to me that you say, well, in seven years, I started going, wow, you know, this is pretty good because what happens is over time that, you know, you, for some people, if they're in debt, what they realize two, three years later, all of a sudden they're, they're out of debt. If you, if you're automatically paying your debt down early and I, I teach you in the automatic millionaire book, how to do that, but all of a sudden your debt's gone or all of a sudden you're like, wow, you know, I never had any emergency money set aside and now I do. Or you turn around seven years later and this is what happens. I get people stopping me on the street and in the airports and sending me emails. Seven years later, you turn around and I get people come up to me like, David, I, I have, I have $100,000 in savings now, or I have a quarter of a million dollars now, or I've got somebody just put on Amazon the other day that, you know, the latte factor, they found, they now own three homes and they were a renter. Well, they didn't go from ha stopping drinking coffee to owning three homes in 30 days. What happened was they read The Automatic Millionaire in 2004, and we're sitting here in 2018. And so over 14 years of doing all this, their whole life is completely different. So what I would say to somebody, you know, back to your question, is that if someone's like really trying to get your financial act together, right. instead of fighting it, go with it. <laughs> <laughs> go with it because here's the thing you're going to get you're going to be older right you're going to blink your eyes and 10 years are going to go by and you're either going to be 10 years old, older and still broke or you could be 10 years older and in much better financial shape and I, you know one of my things in the book I say is that um, 
wealth isn't built in day in days, it's built in decades. And most people who are who, a lot of times, I mean, you, you know, you're in the podcast world, right? People so often it's all about this whole get rich quick scheme. Like, you oh, know, yeah. I got, I got oh. this thing for you and this, oh. this opportunity. And you know, like, I don't know anybody who's, who's gotten rich quick. Well, I know a whole lot of people who have spent their whole life trying to get rich quick and they just, they stay broke fast. It takes right? longer like, to get rich quick. Actually, if you look at the math there, it's, it's, it takes so much longer. And the weird thing is like, you know, the, the, the compound interest charts that you see in these books where they show you like, Hey, oh. if you save $5 a day or $10 a day and you invested it, it could be worth hundreds of thousands of dollars, or it could be worth millions. It all comes true. I, <laughs> like I, I, it I, all works. I knew this would happen because uh, I have like thirty-one questions prepared for you. I've probably gone through seven of them so far, and you are like the world's number one financial coach. If I had to give an elevator pitch, David Bach, world's number one financial coach. And if people listen to the show; they go, "Clay's not that smart. He took algebra three times and his ACT three times, but he's kind of funny." So we listen. So I want to break down three notable quotables, and then I want to sh- tell people about the most current project you're working on, and I want to allow time for you to share with the listeners your most recent project and wh- why they should check it out here. Uh, you have said in the past that people basically inflate in their mind how much money they actually make, and they, under- uh, under- and they almost universally underestimate what they actually spend. What do you mean by this? Uh, all the time. So if someone, if, if you're with a buddy and your buddy's like, yeah, I'm making a hundred grand a year. hundred grand a year. Unbelievable. Okay. And, and then you open up the tax returns. Like, because this is the thing about being a financial boss, you actually get to see the truth, right? Oh, so if yeah. someone says to you, I make a hundred grand a year. Boom. And then you open it up and you really look at the tax returns. No, they don't. They make 85,000 a year. <laughs> okay. They, they rounded it up, right? Nobody right. says, oh, I make $83,000 a year. They go, I make 85 or I make 90. People round up what they make. Mm. They tell other people and they tell themselves, I'm actually making more. So if someone's making 85, they'll, they'll say to people they're making 100. Okay, that's number one. Number two is that then people, when you tell, ask people, well, how much do you spend? Because I always would do this with you know, how much do you think you spend a month? Very for, little at all. I absolutely for, always am very conservative. I never overspend. I'm huge. <laughs> they give you their number, right? right. So you know, I, I'm spending, I, uh, I think, you know, we probably, and people sort of know, right? They go, I think we're spending, let's say, 7000 a month. I'm just giving you a random, a random number, okay? And then again, I'll go into the math, and if they said they're spending 7000 a month, once I go into the real numbers, they're not. They're usually spending eight or 9000 a month. It's always more. So- what happens is if it's just if it's just off by ten percent, if a person inflates in their mind what they're making by ten percent, and then they spend ten percent more than they think they are, there's a twenty percent different twenty percent difference there, right? right? But this is why people go, I don't understand what's wrong with me. I'm working so hard and I'm making good money and I'm still broke. One of the things that's often wrong for people is that they're not telling them the truth to themselves about what they really make. And here's the other thing I'll say there. People take their gross number, right? So I make $100,000 a year. Well, no, you don't. After taxes, you made 55000 I have moved to uh, I moved to Latvia. I have expatriated my money. I no longer pay taxes. I am in some <laughs> trouble with the IIS right now, but the, okay, you're right. So, I mean, that's, a, that's, that's one right there. And I think... Um, you know, money's funny because you you made the point about algebra and geometry. By the way, I hated those classes. I always tell people, hey, you know, the good thing oh, about money it. is it's super basic math, man. Like if if you can take a a, ten, a number ten and subtract one and realize it's nine, you know all you need to know need to know about money. <laughs> nice. That's it. Like That's you make ten dollars and you save a buck, you're in pretty decent shape. Much better than most people. And they go, what? Like, yeah, that's a good place to start. You make a hundred bucks, you save ten dollars. Can you figure that out? Yeah. Okay. Then good. Start there. You know, I want to respect your time, and I want to ask you two more questions here. The American way. The more we make, the more we spend. And if we're not careful, the more we owe. Who said that? David Bach. You said the American way. The more we make, the more we spend. And if we're not careful, the more we owe. I circled that. I highlighted that. I wrote that down. I thought about embroidering it on my face. I thought that might be kind of intense, but I decided not to. But, I mean, talk to me about that. The American way. Why is it so screwed up by default? Well, I mean, we, we created the concept of a consumer society, right? So the American dream is to have a lot of stuff. <laughs> and it's never been easier to market to us to have more stuff, right? So you're on your phone, and now it's an Instagram ad. Click, 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 buy something. Boom. It's never been easier to spend money than it is today. Literally, it's never been easier. You can just click and buy. 
And so everything around us, we were we used to be, we were bombarded by tens of thousands of messages a year. And now we're bombarded by hundreds of thousands, if not millions of messages a year to spend more money. And I, you know, I went on this tirade the other day on, um, where was I? I think it was CNBC. It might've been Yahoo. I can't even track. I've done so many interviews lately, but it was a, a tirade about the insanity of buying new cars every three years mm. and the American way, the American system, the American marketing machine has us programmed to buy new cars every three years. It has this program that if we come into any money, we should buy a new car. It has this program that if we get a tax refund, it's time for a new car. And so Americans go out and they buy new cars and they borrow the money. And there's just, there's no worse place to put your money than into a brand new car. And yet this is, there's like $1.5 trillion now in, in car loans. We have more money in car loans than credit card loans and student loans. And a lot of those loans, like people, they just keep going out and you buy a new car, you buy a $50,000 new car. And you've been focused on the monthly payment because that's how they marketed it to you. And you drive that car off the lot and that car has gone down in value by ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 the moment you drive it off the lot. You borrowed money to buy an asset that immediately goes down in value. It's not an asset, it's a liability. So the, the whole key to really building wealth in America is this. You can either be somebody who spends money or you can be, and you, you can be the consumer or you can be somebody who owns things. Mm. Owners get rich, right? So like you can go to Starbucks and, and have a coffee and spend five bucks. Or if you're going to not give that up, then at least own Starbucks stock, right? Because if you did, you could have made a fortune. Uh, to quote Kanye West, he had a, a meeting here with Mr. Donald Trump, and they shared their dragon energy together. And Mr. Uh, Kanye West, he said, it's important for us to own lands and not brands. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Really, that came, I, I missed that part of the interview. Yeah, I you gotta like, watch just, it. You gotta watch it the I just, fifth time. I just heard about the Superman hat. And I was like, I didn't know. Superman when you watch hat it the fifth hat, time, hey. if you stare at the picture long enough, you will find <laughs> the notable quotable. I want to ask you this here. Um, you said uh, one of your in one of your books, and again, I've got highlights everywhere, and I add it into a big doc that I look at. It says the truth about business is that it's normally very tough. It's very rare that you will start something and succeed right away. And if you do succeed, you might not make a lot of money. Most businesses take at least two or three years to show profits. In my mind, you're America's number one financial coach. Why did you say that? Well, I mean, it's the truth, right? Most, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs that make money their first couple years in business. No. I mean, I mean, I know entrepreneurs who have been in business, unfortunately, five, six, seven, eight years, and they still haven't made any money. You know, what they're hoping is that the as their top line grows, they're going to turn around and sell the business, and that's where their money's going to come from. Right. In fact, the entrepreneur fantasy is I'm going to build a business and I'm going to sell it, and then that's how I'll have money to retire. And today, with all these billion dollar unicorn businesses, you know, it seems like it's easy, but like that's the small, small percentage. In fact, most businesses don't do a million dollars a year in revenue. I think it's less than five percent of businesses do more than a million. I might have that wrong. I have to double check, but at least like. Less than 5% of businesses do over a million dollars a year in revenue. I was in a group called Entrepreneurs Organization for like 16, 17 years. Yep. It's one of the leading entrepreneur organizations. And you had to do a million dollars in revenue to be in the organization. You had to be the founder of the company. And that was like, you know, that line in the sand that you had to do a million dollars or more weeds out most entrepreneurs. Sure. So most entrepreneurs don't have big businesses. And many entrepreneurs, you know, they're constantly putting their money back in the business to grow. And they're not taking money out for themselves or what they've been trained to do by their accountants is run all their expenses through their business. And when they do that, they get to the end of the year and then they have no profit. And then if they have no profit, what it really means is they actually don't have any money. <laughs> and, and, you know, I do the, I, I, you like that sound you just made. I'll do that from stage in front of entrepreneurs where I'll, I'll diagram what that looks like. I'll literally do the math. I'll go oh, like, you're sick. And, they, and, they, and they told you to run all these expenses through and now you got to the end of the year and you're at zero and they go, zero. this is great, you paid no taxes. And then I go, so where's your money? Oh, see, the thing is, you know, there's a sound effect that really typifies, it explains what you just said. <laughs> That's how we feel. Wow. That's how we feel. A lot of accountants are coaching us to be poor, but you're coaching your clients, your listeners, your nation to be successful. And 
I, I would like for you to share with the listeners, what is the most recent project you're working on right now? Because I'm an absolute homer for you. And not because I'm delusional, not because I'm delirious, but because I'm serious about success. And you have blessed me profoundly, and I have only paid you in my lifetime $80 that I know of. I purchased four of your books because I'm a bad person. I, I need to pay you more. Well, and, and you know, really, if you bought if you bought eight out of the books, it means that I made about probably two fifty in royalties, right? So. I'm, I'm gonna mail you. I'm gonna just set up a PayPal GoFundMe account for you. We'll see if we can support <laughs> David Bach, America's number one financial coach. Seriously, you've helped me so much, brother. I mean it, and I just want the listeners to know what you're working on right now because they need to go check it out. Hey, well, I'm super grateful to you. It's been this has been really fun, and I would love to do a show with you again. So this was a blast. I enjoyed it. Um, first of all, come visit me over at my website. Go to davidbach.com, and you can join our newsletter, which is free. And about every two weeks, I send out you know ideas and tidbits that can help you live and finish rich for the rest of your life. Um, so that's davidbach.com. The new book is Smart Women Finish Rich. It just came out about two weeks ago. It's in stores now. It's updated 20 year anniversary edition. We also put out an updated edition of Smart Couples Finish Rich. That's a brand new updated book, and it's in stores now. It's all on my website. Automatic Millionaire has been updated. So three of my books we've updated in the last 18 months, all brand new, available for you. Also, um, I just from an entrepreneur standpoint, I'm a co-founder of a financial service company. The name of it is AE Wealth Management. And we have financial providers all over the country. And so that's been my entrepreneur passion project the last three years. We're the second fastest growing RIA in America, according to Investment News. And we're really growing fast and having a ton of fun doing that, helping retirees all across America. And then the last thing is I am working on finishing uh, my next book, which I'll come back and talk to you about, which is coming out May 7th, 2019. May 7th. Yes. Uh, it is called The Latte Factor. And it is a parable. It's like a who moved my cheese for personal finance that for written for people who probably normally would never read a financial book. I've put my best wisdom, simple nuggets, into a little story that you can read in like less than an hour. And hopefully that's a book that my dream is it will translate all over the world and will spread the message of these simple ideas that, you know, pay yourself first, find your latte factor, save money automatically, but we'll spread it in a way that especially young people will begin to realize that you don't need to be rich to live rich. That's really my next big David, I want to sneak in a bonus question that you, that you can hang up here. Yeah. Why? Because you are so successful. You've been a nine times New York Times bestselling author. You've been on Oprah. You've been on The View. And by the way, you didn't go on Oprah to confess something. Other people go on to Oprah the second. You go on Oprah the first time because you have a new book. The second time to confess. You've been on Regis and Kelly. You've been on Larry King. Go ahead, Gala. You've been on the Today Show, CNBC, Fox Business. I mean, you are the who's who. You are the financial coach for America. Why are you so passionate about helping the listener listening right now? Not the listeners, but the specific person listening right now. Why do you care so much about their financial future? You know, it's, uh, it's such a good question. I gotta be very, I'll just be like totally open hearted and honest with you at this very moment because I'm at a raw point. This has been a long day. I've had a computer crash and I've had like four interviews. And then I've rewritten the copy, the actual copy that's going to go on Amazon uh, for this new book, The Latte Factor. We've been rewriting the copy for three weeks. Hopefully, this is not your worst interview of the day. And 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 the funny thing as I'm as I'm as I basically looked at this document, you know, 45 minutes ago before I got on this interview with you, and I thought to myself, why am I still torturing myself with this work? Like, and, and the answer, the answer is, I, well, I don't know what the, it's like a disease, right? Like I just deeply still care about what I teach. <laughs> I love talking to people like you before we did the interview and finding out I wrote a little book and that message somehow reached you Yep. and it helped change your life. And I still absolutely positively love that, that feeling that I get from knowing that I'm making an impact with my life. And for whatever reason, I think God put me here with this gift. True. To, and this is like my gift. And I keep saying to God, like, am I supposed to keep doing this? And, and and here's the funny thing, like the latte, like I just watched his interview with Tim Ferriss. And I remember when Tim Ferriss reached out to me before he put out his first book. And I was watching this interview with Tim Ferriss and he was talking about, you know, how does he choose the things he works on? And he said, you know, when I go to bed and I, 
and I'm thinking about something and I wake up and I'm still thinking about it. A lot of times I know that's something I have to get, I have to work on. And you, I'll take the latte factor as an example, this book I'm working on finishing right now. I've had that voice in me for 14 years. In 2004, I wanted to do that book after the automatic millionaire. And for 10 years, I random house was my publisher I, I would bring it up every year. I want to do this book. And they go, no, 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 do a different book, right? And so finally I said, you know what? I'm going to go write this book. And then I'm going to go sell it to someone else if they don't want to buy it. And literally, like this book, I went out, first time, wrote the book, designed it exactly how I want it, and it's going to come out with Simon & Schuster. And so, you know, 14 years, there was that voice inside me that just said, you have to go do this book. You have to get this message out. And I don't think I'm unique in that way, right? That's the way entrepreneurs are there's always something you know, i think when you're called to do something vocation yep it's your you know you're called from a higher power um paulo coelho calls it your personal legend and you know i love if you haven't read if you haven't read the alchemist everybody should go read the alchemist it's like the greatest book ever put that on the show notes alchemist yeah the alchemist paulo coelho and um yeah, I went out and met with Paulo Coelho in Geneva because he's like my idol uh, in terms of authors. He's sold like 150 million books and his stories have translated all over the world. And we were out having dinner and then we were out having a lot of drinks. And I think it was around two in the morning and Paulo turned to me and said, what, what, what is the book that you haven't written that you need to write? And I start telling him about the latte factor. I go, Paulo, I want to write this book that will translate all over the world and spread this message to more people. And he looks at me and he goes, well, then, David, you must write that book. Mm. <laughs> so that was 2012. So, you know, it's going to come out. It's going to come out in May 7th, 2019. So I, I have a Bible verse I want to give you that you'd probably don't want from me because I'm certainly not a biblical prophet. But Colossians 3, 23, 24, to me, explains the career of David Bach. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. David, thank you for serving. Thank you for helping. I appreciate you so much. And we like to end the show with a boom, which stands for Big Overwhelming Optimistic Momentum. And so we like to count it down. Chuck, are you ready to count it down? Let's do it. David, are you ready to bring, to, to bring the boom here? Yeah, boom, man. I love Here it. Here we awesome. go. Here we go. Three, two, one, boom. Attend the world's best business workshop led by America's number one business coach for free by subscribing on iTunes and leaving us an objective review. Claim your tickets by emailing us proof that you did it and your contact information to info at thrivetimeshow.com. 